if we talk about how we can um, fight against COVID-19 through the help of technologies, there are hundreds of different approaches people are working. And I think most uh, importantly, in the last six months or seven months, the world has show, uh, seen like more than uh, around, I think, 80 to 90,000 papers have been published in this, uh, in this domain. So it's very difficult to comprehend the knowledge people are learning from different domains. I, I, I'm just talking about some particular different areas in this, uh, in this talk. So let's move into the areas I'm going to be cover, covering today. So I'll introduce a little bit about my group and then I'll talk about the recent update of the COVID-19. And uh, then um, our first work where we have started in February. And then I'll move into second, uh, comparing like um, the coronavirus families like SARS, MARS, and COVID-19. We know all from coronavirus families which are affecting in different years. And can we distinguish them with the help of AI? And then uh, can AI help us to distinguish um, extreme images uh, in, uh, in the early stages? And then uh, we not only worked on the X-ray and CT domain, we worked also on the uh, clinical domain. Like for example, clinical tool to uh, as an early warning tool to help the doctors to categorize the patient into more risky and uh, less risk, risky groups. And later on, I'll talk more about some of our other correlated task uh, works we are currently working on, uh, not yet published, but we are just working. And so then, so let's move into the, um, my current um, uh, funded research projects, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, I have uh, three, uh, or you can say four large uh, projects from Qatar government and some from Qatar, one from Qatar University, this is from Qatar University and the rest of the three from Qatar government. Qatar has an uh, international body called QNRF, Qatar National, uh, National Research Foundation, which uh, uh, like uh, approved grants from, for international collaborators. Uh, in, any international organization, research organization or institute can uh, submit application with, the, with, with collaboration uh, uh, from any institute from Qatar. So there should be a, an institute from Qatar and there can be a collaborator from outside. So uh, we submit this grant and naturally the grants are from 600K uh, to 1.2 million and some are uh, 5 million grants as well. So I have three of, uh, three of uh, such kind of grants. One is for um, smart implant for the hip, hip replacement. And the other one is related to cardiac arrhythmia detection using machine learning. And the third one is our my recent grant, which is basically wireless, contactless um, EMG uh, system for detecting diabetic sensory motor polyneuropathy. Diabetic neuropathy is a very big problem for all over the world. It's also a big problem for our country. And um, this uh, device can help us early detect neuropathy. And the last one is uh, from the International Collaborative Group. Last one is regarding anomaly detection because you know Qatar is hosting 2020 World, uh, 22 World Cup and there will be a lot of different um, like gatherings and events in, in, in the country because of the huge population people uh, will uh, come here. So uh, airport, streets, and the, uh, uh, even the playground everywhere, they need to monitor to the security cameras there, they already deployed that, but for human, it, is, it will be very difficult. So we propose a system to automatically detect the anomaly uh, during the event. And so these are the four awarded grants we have right now. And then recently for COVID, we got uh, two more grants. Uh, one is uh, related to the clinical study, clinical data, I will discuss more in details about that, uh, this particular study and the paper we submitted on this. And then uh, I already patented and um, one uh, paper we submitted, uh, which is under review right now. And this uh, work, which also got award from uh, academic health care system from Hamad Hospital in uh, the core hospital in Qatar, um, for um, designing a system for supporting multiple patients from one single ventilator. Uh, although there are a lot of such product like system proposed in the social media, but those are uh, not intelligent system, but we propose a complete intelligent system. You can double the or triple the number of ventilators with every parameter monitored and controlled. 
And then uh, we got another grant on the diabetic foot ulcer detection. Uh, this is diabetic neuropathy and this is foot ulcer, uh, another extreme condition of the diabetic amylitis. And, and I'm also working on the agriculture. Uh, I had some uh, work with uh, Professor Abdul Rajak uh, and uh, actually I continued that work and I have a couple of grants here in Qatar. And this year I got another grant here in small farm bot for uh, implementing agriculture in Qatar environment. You know, Qatar environment is very harsh. So uh, in this harsh environment, can you utilize robotic uh, tools to uh, do farming? So that's uh, the grant. These are the few grants I have, both are on 1.5, uh, 1 1.9 million. And uh, I have collaboration with, uh, in, inside Bangladesh, as I mentioned earlier, University of Dhaka, North University, Buet, Jagannath University, uh, University, and MIST. And outside uh, Qatar, like um, Bangladesh, uh, international collaboration, I have uh, Malaysia is my most important collaborator. I have several PhD students there. And um, uh, Texas, uh, EQS, I have a collaborator, and University of Hogwarts, I have postdoc and uh, PhD student. And Tent University, I have collaborator. So uh, currently, I have four undergrad groups who are working with me, three masters and five PhD students, along with nine RA and two postdocs. So this is like all about my team who are working with me. So let's move into uh, COVID. So as you all know, COVID, we thought in, in the beginning of the year, it might subside in the middle of the year. But uh, when you come to the later part of the middle of the year, we found that actually it's not happening. So that it's progressing more rapidly. And uh, if you look at the percentage confirmed cases, is significantly used, even though if we don't see the number, China here, but China was the first country, but now USA, Brazil, those highly populated countries you can see are affecting more. And um, the number of people died, uh, depending per million, we don't see our country number here, but uh, if you look at the other countries, specifically India is growing in very high, higher rate. Like uh, I have collaborators from India and they are always saying that, India is progressing really uh, in a dangerous way. And uh, if you look at the second graph, if you look at the new, uh, new cases, we can clearly see that uh, US, India, Brazil, they are in the list and Bangladesh is in the list somewhere in the bottom, but uh, comfortable lower because uh, we are testing very less. And um, total number of cases also you can see those few countries with the highest population are leading and going uh, rapidly. Uh, this graph is actually showing uh, the red part is the increasing number in the last week and the uh, uh, yellow uh, blue plot part is the decreasing number. So some countries are declining. So you can see Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, the Malaysia, they are declining in numbers percentage, Afghanistan less declining. Uh, whereas these countries are inclining. Finland was like almost they declared uh, there's no COVID, but now they are increasing slightly. So some countries are in increasing and the Philippines increasing. So Australia increasing. And um, we know also France is increasing. As Germany is getting second wave. So, so a lot of countries are increasing uh, from previous situation in terms, of, in, in terms of cases. And in terms of days also similarly, when the case will increase, the days will increase definitely. This is linearly related. So we can see some countries are declining, some countries are increasing. So uh, in terms of that. So, from UK uh, the, uh, they, uh, and um, from US data, they identified that at least we should identify, although we know it's very difficult for Bangladesh perspective, but uh, they identified some of the uh, work activities in low risk group and some of the activities in me medium risk group and some of the activities in high risk groups. So what we should not do, like big gatherings you can understand and just avoid this medium kind of uh, risk. So it's, it will be difficult to mention everything. You can see some of the things here. So regular day-to-day -day activities with a, li a least human interaction, less uh, human interaction has low risk. If you can do the follow the uh, like guideline from WHO, then we can minimize the risk. And if we talk about the uh, infection and uh, its severeness, so you can see around 81% are mild, like a flu. Stay at home, you will be safe. But 19% are not 
that case. Severe around 14% and five, around 5% 5 is critical. And among those, 19% people are dying basically. So these populations should be highly categorized and they should have proper treatment and support from the hospital. And this population should not crowd hospital. So that's the important thing. So how do you identify them? Later on, we'll discuss that. And then, of course, the age, we all know that uh, COVID has a high relation with age. And this is not only for COVID. This is for SARS and MERS. All these diseases, we have seen the same trend. Uh, around uh, above 40, it has a higher impact. So in terms of the comorbidity or the existing other existing condition, if we see if there is no other diseases the patient have, then only 9% death rate chance, 0.9%, very low, less than 1%. So you can see if you have other diseases, then it has, you should be uh, worried about or you should be concerned. So if you, any, any of your family members have other, some other diseases, then if you get infected or some of your relatives get infected, you have to be very careful about that. And other point you all know that in Bangladesh, I think it's 27, 73, but in uh, international level, it was 73% women was infected and then 60, it's a, it's a death population. So 37% women over died. So you can see male are more affected here in COVID. And um, in terms of ethnicity, from UK uh, research it found, uh, identified that uh, black people are more dying than the white people. Even the Bangladeshi population are more dying than the Indian population. So, uh, and male and female, of course, you can see that is a distinction. Uh, it is present for everywhere. So even Chinese are less dying than the other population. Although we know Chinese immunity is not that good, but Bangladesh are dying for some reason. So ethnic, ethnicity is very crucial. Uh, probably the population is, is a crucial factor for dying Bangladeshi population in UK more. And then this is the thing we need to worry about. So you can see that tuberculosis was the, uh, or the largest on the, on the list. And when I was presenting on March or April, uh, this, this COVID was here somewhere, but it now jumped up up in the, in the second place. So highest number of, second highest number of people are in a million per day dying uh, in this disease. But of course, these are, these are changing. Tuberculosis, these are regular. Every year people are dying. So some of the diseases are every year people are dying. Some of these diseases which are dying and it's not controlling. Once it is controlled, then it will become white or it become absolute from this list. We hope that will happen soon. So let's move into where we contribute and what is our contribution in this pandemic situation. So uh, initially we thought, okay, uh, RT-PCR, the reverse transcription polymerase chain reaction, RT-PCR test was the, was the benchmark technique uh, and then it became QRT-PCR, quick uh, RT-PCR technique uh, invented by different countries. But still the technique is expensive, specialization required, uh, specialized laboratory required and time consuming and um, and the uh, positivity rate I uh, I found in the literature when I was writing on this paper most of the literature it was 630 to 63 percent so positivity rate so a lot of cases are undiagnosed or misdiagnosed so by RT-PCR although it, it, it is the benchmark so there should be some other um, technique and uh, approaches. And uh, when we are doing this work in uh, February and March, WHO strictly pro prohibited CT and X-ray to be used as a benchmark because uh, straightforward CT and X-ray cannot be used. CT and X-ray should be used with AI. Even when we submitted our paper, that, even that time uh, people are saying that uh, CT should, X-ray should not be used. But later on, it became evident that X-ray with AI can do the job. So I'll show some of uh, our first uh, our first work, what we did. So for creating the data set, we took uh, like good effort on collecting all the publicly available data sets, all the published paper, where you get X-ray, COVID X-ray, we collected. We collected around 423 uh, COVID images and this number of normal and this number of viral pneumonia images. And we gathered them and we published them online with our paper, which is now on their IEEE access. So, on this, um, on this data set, we use transfer learning. So we, uh, probably all of you know about transfer learning, but just I want to uh, explain for those who 
might not familiar with. So in uh, deep learning approaches, uh, we know when you are learning a network from scratch, you need a larger data set. You need a powerful uh, machine, or you can say GPU. And then um, we also need um, like a larger, like huge uh, time for training the network because it's, it, it's a time consuming process. So if we can utilize the train network and change the problem to a particular problem rather than the original problem, specific different problem, and uh, we can then utilize the train network with the weights of the net, uh, network are not learning from stress then it will learn from the pre-trained level so it will take lesser time and even you can freeze some of the layers so that it will first train and you can um, train with a smaller number of data set and utilize this for classifying a particular problem so uh, like uh, you know ImageNet is a very popular data uh, set with uh, thousands of classes and if if a uh, network trained on that particular set data set and you can utilize it for extra and uh, x-ray with three or four classes so we did the same thing so because our data set was imbalanced uh, why i'm saying it's imbalanced because you can see the number of normal and covid and viral all the viral and normal images are similar but covid was different it's like five times smaller so we need to increase the covid image five times so this augmentation technique we have to apply to make the data set balance for training at least okay so we can uh, augment the data and then train and then neutralize it. So we did that. So you can see clearly from the confusion matrix, um, out of 423 images, only one images are misclassified as normal and only two images are misclassified as viral. And now the normal image was misclassified as COVID, which is a very uh, handy thing. And then some of the misclass images are misclassified as viral because of the like a uh, very, very early stages of uh, problem like uh, viral images maybe matches with simulate uh, like image features matches with normal and out of the viral images we found four viral images um, uh, were misclassified as COVID and because it's a disease class still uh, 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 like a doctor can still investigate further by RT-PCR and other technique even CT uh, to investigate why, whether this patient or even clinical data to see whether this patient really have COVID or not but these are normal, as I said, there are some common features between normal and viral in the early stages. So uh, if we look at the um, performance matrix, you can see these are uh, like in, in MATLAB even, we have 18 different net pre trained networks. You can just directly use them. And we use PyTorch to, uh, there are like uh, 20 plus networks, pre trained networks. And ChexNet is one of the networks which is designed and developed from uh, Stanford group. They make it available, uh, which was trained on X images, more than 100K X images. And um, so this pre-trained pre network, because it's trained on X, we are ex uh, expecting that it will do, like it will perform better on X images. But these image networks were not initially trained on X images. They are trained on a regular object car and other things. So. Uh, so you can uh, expect that after doing augmentation and training with a good number of images uh, using augmentation technique, uh, actually DenseNet is performing very good job in classifying uh, with a very high sensitivity. You can see around 90% sensitivity uh, for detecting COVID. And um, which encourages us uh, to investigate why this is happening. So we look at the deeper layer images. You can see here a normal image in the deeper layer and uh, COVID images. So you can see clearly some distinct feature on the COVID images. You can see clearly a normal, viral, uh, sorry, COVID and viral. So viral has this whitey shaded all over the lungs, some, some, some gap and some gap uh, infection, some gap. Whereas COVID is a lumped structure of infection. Even whole lungs sometimes we got C infected, but this is a, it's a unique distinct feature which is not clearly visible in the normal X-ray uh, sometimes, in the early stage especially, uh, but it becomes very visible in the deeper layer. So machine can identify very precisely uh, in, uh, from the, uh, the X-ray images. That's why this high sensitivity we, can, we are getting. So 
the misclassified cases we observe. Why this is misclassified? And we check with the doctors, and doctors identified that these and these two images are misclassified, and these two images are actually very normal. They said there is no mark of infection in the doctor's eye, even. So, so doctor says uh, even very minor investigation, you cannot see the infection. Maybe very early stages of infection. Infection doesn't reach to the lungs, but RT PCR become positive. So, we, our ground truth was RT PCR. So that's why we we know these are misclassified, but image doesn't say that but this one has some infection you can see clearly but uh, that is that's not revealed in the in the deeper layer that's a machine so you can see this only one images are really misclassified where we have some signs of covid so uh, ai can be very powerful too from this experiment we see so then we encourage to see okay if ai can identify covid with very high reliability we know sars has been removed from the world sars patient are, are no more but MARS still present. In last year, December, we, in Qatar, we got MARS patient. So in Middle East area, MARS patient is still there. So whether there is any, any distinction AI can identify from COVID, SARS, and MARS uh, from the images. So, you know, uh, COVID images, we got 423, but uh, MARS and SARS uh, happened earlier, and there's not too many patient uh, and images. This is in 2003, and this is around 2012 and 11, 12, 13, like that. Uh, until now. So we collected that in the same uh, way from online sources. We made a data set and uh, we made that available publicly. And we investigated using transfer learning approach. But we, we got up to like 88 to 90 percent, not uh, to the level of uh, COVID to normal scenario. So then we apply some means processing techniques. Original images like that, for example, we look at the histogram. And then we did histogram equalization. Uh, then we identified some area become saturated in the histogram equalization. So what we did, we used contrast limited uh, adaptive histogram equalization, which, which actually equalized the histogram in the uh, in a region oriented. So that gives better uh, like uh, image enhancement. So we utilize that, and then you know in in the hospital there is a good practice in using complement image uh, to understand more about the. Extra because extra, although it's a 2D technique, but it's not always a 2D. It's actually it have 3D information. You can clearly see this picture is not a 2D picture. It has depth information because extra works with uh, relative intensity. So you know, um, uh, it it has depth information. So we use this complement image. This is original. You can see the histogram is simply flipped. So we, we use this technique individually. We investigated. Then we combine them. You know, um, in, a, in a CNN network, conventional neural network, we have three different channels in the input normally, typically. So uh, in, in, a, in a grayscale image, we normally feed all three images as a, one image as a copy, of, we put the three copy of, in, uh, in the input, three channel. Uh, but what we did in this, in this project, we uh, took original, Klahi, and the complement, and then put in the three different channels. And we try to classify the classes. And as you, uh, as you see, this is the number of images we have for COVID, Mars, and such. And um, this, uh, which uh, do five-fold cause validation, training, augmentation, and this is validation, and then powerful test. So if you look at the result, um, for the best performing networks, you are showing only the results here, four networks. So you can see DenseNet and Inception, these are the deepest networks. Deep, uh, it has high number of layers, it has 201 layer. So this has 48 layers. So you can see SqueezeNet is the lowest like uh, number of layers and intermediate is ResNet. So original image, it was somehow inception was performing the best. But when you use Klahi, you can see network performance become independent almost. So they are very close. But when you use complement image, we found really, really good result. Like uh, deep networks perform very well. But when you combine them, our results significantly boost for inception. So we understand that uh, like low layer networks are not performing well for the complement images, but deep layer networks are performing very good for complement and that boost in the result in the three channel approach. So then we summarize the result. We actually, in the three channel approach, we got very high overall performance and individual sensitivity as well. You can see very good sensitivity for COVID, Mars and SARS. In the doctor, like a doctor cannot distinguish them. 
that's the beauty of this uh, work. Like AI can distinguish even the family members of COVID, but doctor cannot distinguish them. What is whether that is COVID or that is Mars or that is SARS patient. They have to do clinical experiment to distinguish them, but AI can distinguish the very high uh, reliability. You can see only two images was misclassified from the COVID, but we identified Mars has some feature relation with COVID, whereas such has no relation with Mars. Such is not um, like similar to COVID. And we found that these three misclassification of search uh, category uh, was like um, uh, misclassified with very low probability, like around 50 to 60%, not very high reliability. Whereas this 10 was misclassified with very high reliability. And we look at the deep layer images. I have the paper link here. Um, where we showed the, the deeper layer and we identified that actually there is a, some there is some similarity between COVID and Mars features. So that was our finding from this one. So COVID can be identified from other family members using machine learning. Then we started to investigate. Okay, we look at the deep layer networks. Can we utilize shallow networks and um, identify early COVID? early stage COVID, because uh, when there is a l large amount of patches on the X-ray images, even human can easily identify, but early stage COVID identification is more challenging for the doctors, uh, for the radiologists. So uh, what we did, we utilized X-ray image to identify, uh, use the, uh, like uh, one of the transfer learning network to like, we use DenseNet basically, because uh, ChexNet is made from DenseNet, ChexNet uh, one to one, uh, ChexNet is a, uh, network chain from DenseNet one to one. So we use that network to find out the feature matrix. And that feature matrix we train on our previous work, convolution support estimate networks, is a very complex shallow networks network and we use that uh, to classify. So now this, uh, because we are doing it in a two layer, first one is just creating the feature matrix and then from there we are using uh, the feature to identify, classify them uh, using the compact network. Uh, we, we identified that in a very shallow network like CSAN1, you can see, we can get very high accuracy in classifying early stage COVID and uh, normal patient. So you can see deep layer networks like ChexNet, testnet one to one inception, they can perform very well. But uh, of course they uh, require uh, larger time for computation and uh, computational capability of the system should be very high. Whereas this network is very compact, you can utilize in a very, uh, like in a more very uh, low co co complexity capability machine, uh, we can we can perform this one. So that was our work, which is under, under review now biomedical uh, uh, transitional neural network. So you can even get a very good accuracy with the help of a compact network, but of course the compact network should be designed properly. Then we started to investigate, can we identify the amount of infection in the lungs, percentage infection, and uh, can distinguish COVID infection and non-COVID infection, uh, infection along with the uh, percentage area with the, with the lungs and things. So uh, by this time we got very, hold of very large data set. Now we have uh, around uh, 36, 100 plus COVID-19 images, and we create, created a very large data set. And this, to the, to the best of our knowledge, this is the largest data set right now. We have this amount of COVID, this amount of normal, and this amount of non-COVID infection images. So we um, use that to create the segmented lungs. So any COVID infection, some, uh, if you look at the COVID X images, some of the X become completely white. It's very difficult for the best or robust segmentation model to segment the lung properly. But our network, we trained it, now we can segment it very reliably. And you can see some, some uh, greenish spot, and that actually tells you which, what, like, what is the percent of area of the lungs is infected, and what is the probability of a particular patient uh, is a COVID or non-COVID. So we'll not only show the patient is COVID or non-COVID, but also will show that the patient, what is the percentage of um, infection of that, pa of that patient. So this is the one we are currently working, we are finalizing towards a C product because you know, there is uh, several companies in the world is working on this to make it as a product, whether so that then 
uh, whenever any, any X ray is taken by the radiologist, they can immediately classify it and also tell the patient, show the uh, area how much it is infected and what is the extent of infection. Then uh, we work in a different domain, uh, image processing domain, but different area, screening the people because you know when the airports are opening, uh, schools are opening, college, universities are opening, hospitals are open, like uh, marketplaces are opening. Um, we need to screen the people. The best screening technique is uh, so far, easy screening technique is the temperature. Although it's not very reliable, but it's like doing some extent of job. So we collect a data set. Uh, we have a, uh, like around 14K static and uh, total images from video and uh, original images. And um, uh, this is thermogram images. So we can, on a person, when the person is walking, based on the thermogram images, with the help of AI, we can measure the temperature. On, on real time manner. So even right now we can uh, measure them in a few number of people, but we want to make it uh, as real time as for like an airport, some uh, flight landed, all the people are coming in the lobby. So camera will be set to sit down and AI will uh, distinguish the temperature even in a user crowd, one person will be identified and a uh, security personnel will be informed that this person should be removed from the lot. And, should be investigated more. So this is another work we are currently working on. We have some initial result, but we will be working more. And then I will be talking about here an early warning tool as a clinical tool. And uh, to work with this, I have actually worked uh, with several hospitals in Bangladesh and China, and UK, uh, India, Malaysia, uh, Kuwait. So the result, this is under uh, review now, uh, cognitive computation. So we have a, a data set from China, Wuhan. Also, and there is a 375 patient and, um, and this original work was published in Nature and then we got the data set from them. Now we, are, we worked and we published another paper. So we are working now second one. Uh, there is another coming one based on the Bangladeshi data. So, this 375 patients which are classified into three different groups, general, severe, and critical. So in the general, it's classified by the doctors based on the symptoms when they come to the hospital. So in the general group, some survive, most of them survive, some die. Severe group, some like 50% died, 50% survived. A critical group mostly died, a few survived. So we, we have this information, we have their ground truth information, like uh, who, did, who died and who survived. And we have several, like 76 biomarker. Biomarker, I mean, uh, CVC, clinical, clinical data from uh, blood test uh, and uh, other tests, like uh, some of you might be familiar with the test, D-dimer, um, lymphocytes, neutrophils. These uh, clinical parameters, doctor regularly test uh, to identify patient is improving or degrading. So we uh, have that 76 biomarker and we use machine learning tool to, um, uh, rank them and then we have uh, used Exibus 3 for ranking them but we have this is the paper one published uh, in the nature group they rank them uh, before ranking they impute the absent data by minus one and we would uh, impute them using the machine learning tool first mice technique and then we uh, rank them. So the basic difference from their technique here and our technique is they impute with minus one, the absent data, missing data, but you use machine learning tool to impute the data. And then we rank them. So our ranking uh, features are different than their ranking features, but some of the features you can see similar. So we took 10, best 10 here, they showed best 10 here. And then using their approach, you can see if you go from one to 10 features, the maximum area under the curve, you can see 95%. And which can they can get from after three features. So they say the best three features, these best three features, lactate dehydrase, lymphocyte percentage, and high C-reactive sensitive C-reactive protein. Someone has clinical background, they can understand. But I don't have that background, but after last two months, I've been studying all this now, I have the clinical background almost. So uh, this 95%, and here you can see our technique can, uh, reach up to 97% with the five features. So we are getting around 2% gain and that significantly pro, uh, improves the performance of the network. So I can show here uh, with, the, with their approach, 
this this is the confusion matrix false false, uh, false negative and false positive you can see here and our one you can see we managed to uh, get more uh, patient in the true positive and true negative group group so our percentage is higher this is not the main uh, benefit basically the main benefit is we develop a no gram score which is very useful to the doctors like if you say i de designed a, a machine learning algorithm which can say whether this patient is will die or survive this is not only helpful rather if you can tell that okay uh, categorize the patient from very early stage and uh, help the doctor to identify the severity of the patient that would be really useful so we design a nomogram this uh, with the five best features and how this nomogram works so take an example of a patient ido 241 a 17 neutrophils this lymphocytes this lactic diet is this and crp high sensitive crp is this so any hospital in bangladesh like the bmc they have the, they do, does this test so they do this test so they, you can get this data and we design a web application and mobile application so you can put this number immediately the software will calculate this score and this score will be added up together to get the total score and this total score will be linked up to the probability and this probability is 80 percent and this 80 percent means the patient is in high risk how we did that we categorize the patient into three group zero to five percent is low risk 5 to 50 percent is moderate risk and 50 to 100 is high risk group and then we investigate whether our risk group is good enough or not so we've identified on the test set and the training set this is test and this is training set so you can see we categorize patient 83 patient in the low risk and all of them were alive none of them died and the high risk group we categorize uh, 126 patient into 111 was was died or died and 15 or alive and you can see in the moderate risk group 41 are alive and 12 was died so uh, most of the patient in the high risk group actually died you can see in the train and test set train set test set even it's better 94 percent and none of the low risk group patient is died. so you can see when and this is in the first day when they come to the hospital uh, some patient died after 30 days i will show graph uh, in the next slide so we can say 30 days before this patient is going to die so doctor can uh, separate those patients who are in severe risk and treat them separately and those patients who are in low risk group they can be treated at home and moderate risk group can be in the hospital bed high risk group should go to the ICU so that's how uh, we feel uh, we can help the doctors so this you can see this zero line is the death of the patient and, and these are the hours so some patient died after 760 hour which is around 32 days and we identify this dotted line and the vertical line. Vertical line is the point when they come to the hospital. And the vertical dotted line, where the dotted line becomes solid line, here we actually identified them, they're gonna die. So you can see I'm showing here 52 patients who died. So from the test set, uh, we identified them very, very early stage. So those patients could be separated and treated separately. And so that um, causality can be reduced. So then, uh, just a quick recap of what we ha are currently doing uh, apart from our current these works. Several works we are actually continuing because one publication produces several other publications. We are uh, we have a data set where we have X-ray of the patient and CT of the patient. You know there are hundreds of papers published in CT, but uh, CT is not feasible for most of the countries. Even UK didn't use CT that much. China used CT a lot. USA doesn't use CT that much uh, because a patient need to be more taken to the bed and uh, is a very contagious disease, very difficult to take the patient to the CT machine. So X-ray is more pre preferred. So we are comparing whether X-ray can reveal the information with the help of AI, what CT open eyes can reveal. So CT of a patient and uh, can be replaced uh, with the help of X-ray and AI. That's uh, what, what we are currently doing. And the other one, as I said, prognostic model we did with uh, 76 features where there are several biomarkers. Some biomarkers are expensive to uh, like 
get uh, some hospital don't, some country don't do that some hospital don't do that so what we try we are trying we are trying complete blood count cbc i know i, I think you all know that cbc is the cheapest uh, it costs 100 to 300 taka in bangladeshi uh, currency uh, to do this uh, test and uh, we are trying to make a prognostic model and we already get a very good result on this i'm not showing here today we are preparing the draft so this is very promising uh, for bangladesh uh, and other our third world countries uh, just from cvc data we can get similar like similar prognostic model like this one uh, identify we'll have similar similar chart similar mobile application we'll have a mobile application along with this which can be used in the hospitals uh, easily and um, uh, categorize the patient into low risk mid risk and uh, high risk group and then uh, we got hold of a Russian data set where we have um, normal patient and different degree of severity uh, of COVID and uh, for, for CT data. So you're working on CT segmentation, lung infection segmentation and severity classification. There is no such work published actually, even though a lot of hundreds of work published in severity detection in, in, in CT uh, area, but severity wise, there's not, nothing published yet. So we are trying to categorize patient like uh, follow up the patient with the help of ct whether the patient is progressing or degrading so that's uh, uh, are the COVID related works thanks for listening and uh, please feel free to ask me any question regarding the topic i have presented